If I were a betting man, based on the numbers, you saw my last video. This lighting too much? Two weeks ago, I showed you guys this device. I don't know, is it too much? The web or wrist ejection bracelet. Well, that's definitely too much. A lot more people than usual ended up watching this showcase. Thank you guys very much for that. And thank you YouTube for the much needed stimulus package. I can't, I can't do this. Now, what you guys may not know is that I've been making devices like this for a really, really long time. And while I'm not the only one, I am unique in the sense that I'm trying to make these devices as usable as possible. I really want this to be an actual consumer product that you can buy. It's part of the big push for all the products I'm making for my company, Dragline Dynamics, including Charlotte, the eight-legged robot, Symbolite, and a whole host of other things that are coming. Now for this device specifically, last week we demonstrated USB-C charging, but two weeks before that, I demonstrated how I made this uniquely rigid bracelet. It has to be rigid because it has a pressure vessel in it. We made this rigid bracelet actually adjustable so it can fit larger wrists, smaller wrists, whatever. As we continue this quest toward ultimate usability, there is one problem that I really have yet to solve, though I've tried many, many times. And it becomes pretty apparent if you look at some versions of this device. Now, most recently you see I have this very sleek bracelet. This is the newest version of the device that I showcased to you guys in the last video. And it's really sleek, very compact, could be a little bit thinner, but it's the most compact version of the device I've made so far. Battery, circuitry, mechanisms, pressure vessel, motor, all included in this one bracelet. And that's a huge advancement. But if I'm trying to shoot material out of my wrist, how am I controlling that? So you see in the last video, I didn't pay that much attention to that. I just have this little electronics port there. I just plug in a, a little force sensitive resistor and I can activate this device. That's not very consumer friendly. And you see most versions of this device that I've made have some sort of trigger on the palm. This version, which I made back in March, you'll see if I snap this onto my wrist here, has that FSR trigger on the palm. This is also not very consumer friendly. What, what is this? What if I wanna grab a mug, do some other stuff with my hands? I really need this device to be just like a bracelet and that's it. Until we accomplish that, it's not gonna be the wrist ejection bracelet. It's gonna be the wrist ejection bracelet and a little bit of thing sticking out of it. Now, over the years, I've solved this problem in a variety of different ways. Back when I had mechanical activation of valves instead of electronic activation of valves, I had a mechanical lever that I had to press, which is very amenable to a really high pressure valve. And I sometimes use this spring system to kind of deploy this trigger onto the palm. And the benefits of electronic activation, which is what I have now using an electric motor here, means that I can use all kinds of unique sensors. And my absolute dream for tackling this problem of triggering this device is to use what's called force myography. Now, I've talked about this before if you're a regular viewer, but hopefully there's some new people here because last video did pretty good. It's a lot like electromyography, but that uses electrodes to measure electrical signals being sent to your muscles. That can be affected heavily by things like sweat, but force myography, in theory, shouldn't be affected by the salinity of your skin. Force myography essentially uses a grid of force sensors, like the same force sensitive resistors I use on this device already. I have a grid of 10 different force sensing resistors that I embedded into this 3D printed flexible bracelet. And I've been examining if you wear this bracelet, can you use these sensors that are just making contact with your wrist? There's nothing you know, overlapping onto your hand. Can those sensors perform gesture recognition so that you can use a specific hand signal to activate this device at any hour of the day? Now to translate these 10 sensor signals into a binary firing signal, I use machine learning, which is a great tool for this type of perception. During my PhD, I used a lot of these algorithms to deal with robotic tactile perception. So it's not a dissimilar problem, but I do want my products to be relatively inexpensive. So the machine learning models can't have a lot of weights. So they need to run on a relatively rudimentary microcontroller. So I paired this sensor with some data collection hardware that I created to label in real time gestures that I'm making with my hand. Then I could use that data to train a machine learning model, which will hopefully generalize to any situation in which I'm wearing this sensor. Now, also with machine learning models like this, they can be difficult to design and often that's done on intuition alone. You have to make a lot of choices about the hyperparameters, the width of 
of the network, the depth of the network, what kind of activation functions are you using. It's possible that these small, difficult to make choices affect the accuracy of this model quite a lot. Instead of doing just like a grid search of all the possible hyperparameter choices, I elected to use evolution-based methods to basically select a set of different hyperparameter selections as individuals that have these hyperparameters as traits. And then they go through a process based on Darwinian evolution to couple and mutate and reproduce to create successive generations. And the result was that the accuracy of these models would increase each generation. And I was able to get on the test set of the training data set, the 95% accuracy. But since the test set comes from the same distribution as the training set, since it's a randomly selected set of the training data, it wasn't able to generalize very well. To get this to demonstrably work, I would have to collect data and then immediately train and deploy the model. And then I would see some success. If I were to collect data, train the model, I would see a high accuracy on my test set, but then I could wait two days, right? I would have taken the bracelet off, put it back on, it'd be in a slightly different position, and I would find that it wouldn't work because it hasn't generalized well. Now, I haven't collected a lot of data yet. I just haven't had a chance. There's a lot that I've been doing with the release of Charlotte, a couple of consulting projects that I have. I do really cheap tutoring. If you wanna check out my tutoring and consulting services on my website, dragline.tech. But I'm really excited to get back to this project when I have the chance. But in the meantime, I do predict, based on what I've seen, that it's gonna be a lot harder than I anticipated. And as a result, I think that the web device is gonna need an intermediate solution. Something a little bit simpler than forest myography, but something that still frees up the palm for activities of daily living for most of the time. But something that allows for a trigger like this to be deployed onto the palm whenever necessary. Most of the time, it's an ordinary bracelet, and then you press a little button and the trigger makes itself known. I have a feeling that this will require somewhat of a clever mechanical solution. There will have to be something collapsible that's hidden inside the device. Now the first thing I thought of was something telescopic, you know, like those toy lightsabers. Now obviously that means that I'll have to have a lot of thickness because there'll be several segments that are connected together and then they collapse inside one another. It's gonna be tricky to have that extend out and then actually conform to the shape of my palm. That's kind of what I want this to do. It's not impossible to have something telescoping be curved, but it's a lot harder. Now, my first concept was a bunch of little tiny curved leaf springs that deform individually and when put together form one really long spring that can extend quite a bit. Now, in theory, this would work, but after printing it, I realized it would take some time to figure out what the correct shape of these curved parts should be. Right now they're elliptical, but I'm kind of thinking that's not the right way to do it. And after I printed a couple of these, I realized that this isn't really in line with my desire to keep the part count low, which is a huge part of keeping costs down for making a device like this. So I realized I shouldn't go through the trouble of figuring it out and just scrap the idea entirely. It was then that I glanced over and saw something that changed my approach entirely. I was looking at my simple tape measure. Now, a tape measure is actually pretty interesting geometry. It's a long strip of sheet metal. The sheet metal has a curved cross section to it. It has an element of bi-stability or maybe just multi-stability in general. It has a stable configuration when it's completely straight. It wants to return to being straight. You'll find that it's also stable in this configuration as well. The weight of this section is enough to resist the bending. If you don't roll out enough of it, it goes back to being stable over there. It is able to fit inside this small container here. And that's because it's obviously it's rolled up in here because when it's being rolled, it's bent in this direction. And you'll see if you bend it, in that direction, it kind of acts just like a really flexible material. And that also means that because it can bend really easily in one direction, it can be rolled up really easily in that direction. If I roll out just enough where the weight is sufficient to where it stays bent, if I try bending it the other way, see, it doesn't stay and it goes right back to being straight. Once it comes out, that cross section constrains it to be rigid. What if you had the stable equilibrium configuration of this measuring tape? Instead of being straight, it could be curved. And what that could do is I could have a very stiff measuring tape-like structure stretching out across my palm. When it's extended, it conforms perfectly to my palm shape, but it can roll up onto a motor or a winch in the back of this device. And with the help of 3D printing, we can construct that exact shape such that it has a curved cross section. But instead of that cross section being swept across a straight path, like with the measuring tape, 
it swept across a curved path. So I made a couple different versions of this type of structure. In 3D printed thermoplastic polyurethane, I used a 90 Shore A1, kind of a middle of the road stiffness, that's this black material here. And you can see it's pretty flexible, um, but also does have that nice curved resting shape we wanted. I also tried this in a much tougher material. This is more like 70 D Shore hardness. So this one you can see is really stiff. It holds that rigid curved shape really well, but I think it's a little too stiff. It kind of resists bending too much. And so we're gonna go with this uh, softer material. Okay, so we disassembled our device completely. That's what we have to do to add all of these new parts for this new type of deployable trigger. Uh, but the first thing that I have to do before putting everything back together is actually just get this trigger mechanism working right. Put this motor with this flexible trigger here onto this device and see if it can go through this little slot. maybe could be a little bit stiffer at the base or press down a little bit nicer. We're just gonna go ahead and see if it can retract. Okay, that works pretty well. You can see now it's wound around that uh, motor axle. That's pretty cool. But now the question is, can it be deployed? Let's check that out. So all we have to do is reverse the polarity. This will be eventually done via the motor controller. Bruh. We have a bit of a problem here. So the motor ran backwards, but it actually takes quite a bit of force to send this back out. It's, it's just not stiff enough uh, in this direction. It's, it's pretty stiff um, to resist like bending at this point, but in terms of buckling under compression, it's still pretty capable. So I'm gonna try to come up with a solution for that real quick. So my solution is to use a multi-material printing technique where I have both the rigid material, the white material in the middle here that resists buckling, and also have the flexible black material in the middle so that the cross section isn't as stiff. All right, so here's that composite material trigger structure. And you can see I added a little bit of an extra bend, hopefully make it conform a little bit better. I also added this casing here, and I think that will help the structure to have something to push against and stop it from coming out on this side. So it still goes in. Now let's see if it can come out. No, oh, it's still getting stuck there. Pull it out to here. Can it go? No, a little bit more. There we go. Essentially like up until this really big bend. So if I just pull it in right to that bend right there. Can it go out again? Yeah. So it can go pretty much just past this big bend and it works. But going past that, I don't know what it's gonna take to make that happen for now. So it's possible that I'll have to optimize this structure a little bit so that it works properly. I'll probably use some physics-based models to try to predict uh, the behavior of a structure like this. I don't know what that'll be yet, but for now, just as a proof of concept, I'm just going to make it just go in right to there. And that should be good enough just to show uh, that this works. So we're gonna go ahead and just put the rest of the device together and see what it looks like.
Okay, so here you'll see we have most everything assembled from a mechanical and electrical standpoint. But in terms of controlling this thing, we actually have two actuators now. One electric motor to activate the valve, just like we did before. And we have this electric motor on the back that retracts and deploys the trigger. What this is supposed to do when I turn it on is to automatically perform a cycle of the valve motor to shut the valve, just in case it's open, just to make sure it's closed. But you'll see once I turn it on here, it actually it does a little retract on the trigger. And that's because I switched the motor ports around. So we're gonna have to reprogram this thing. That's a good opportunity for me to thank the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. Now, PCBWay is your one-stop shop for rapid prototyping. And one of the services they provide is called Turnkey Surface Mount Assembly. This is essentially what allowed me to get this ARC controller, which is the curved shaped microcontroller that sits inside this device. It has an AT SAM D21 chip that can be programmed with many different functionalities, but it is also equipped with the TC1508A dual H bridge motor driver. Now before I was just using one of these H bridges to control the valve motor, but now since this chip is already included, I can just hook that second trigger motor to that other H bridge on the TC1508A. I designed this board in KiCad and selected all of the components that go on it, gave them a bill of materials, and they made the PCB and also surface mount soldered all of the components onto it. PCBWay has made a lot of things easier for me in solving this trigger issue. They also are the ones who manufactured my designed FMG research board that I use for the FMG project. And I'm very grateful to them for sponsoring my projects and for sponsoring this video. So if you're interested in getting your own custom microcontroller just like this, go ahead and click the link in the description below for $5 off their amazing services. That's 3D printing, CNC machining, and PCB manufacturing. Now let's get to programming the board that's inside this device. Okay, so we've got everything programmed here and we're gonna go ahead and just test it. In place of an FSR, I've just got these two wires here. So the way I have this programmed is we have the ordinary opening and closing of the valve. There's nothing in the pressure vessel right now just like that. But if we do a double tap, it will retract the trigger and extend the trigger. It's pretty cool, right? I think it works pretty well. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to stop the video there, run out of time, but next time we get to this project, we're definitely gonna attach that FSR trigger to this new retractable structure and see how that looks. I'm really excited for that. Now, next week, we're gonna get back to Charlotte versus Charlotte. It's gonna be the third and final part of my Spiderbot racing series. And we're gonna figure out who is the best model, who is the model that's gonna be released, Big Charlotte or Little Charlotte. So make sure you tune in for that. We're gonna do all kinds of fun little tests and experiments, little obstacle courses. It's going to be a great time. So I hope to see you there. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Stay safe, stay amazing, and I'll see you guys in the next video.